The gentleman sitting to my left really does not need an introduction, but I will do one anyway. To say that George Schultz has had a distinguished career in government, academia, and the world of business would be a vast understatement. He is one of only two individuals in our nation's history to have held four different federal cabinet posts. He was the first director of the modern day Office of Management and Budget when it was reorganized under Richard Nixon. He is the 11th Labor Secretary of the United States, the 62nd Treasury Secretary, and the 60th Secretary of State, where he and Ronald Reagan led a peaceful solution to the Cold War. George Schultz has served his nation in times of war. Upon graduating from Princeton, he became an artillery officer in the, in the United States Marine Corps serving in the Pacific. He came back to the States. He went on to teach at three of America's most prestigious universities. MIT, do we have any MIT people in the house? Okay, one MIT. <laughs> the University of Chicago. And Stanford University. Okay. <laughs> For eight years, Secretary Schultz was president of a major engineering and construction company, the Bechtel Corporation. In 2017, it was the eighth largest privately owned company in the United States. In 2018, George Schultz simply refuses to slow down. He has two books in the works. One, a recollection of past writings and why they're applicable to these times. The second, which he's in the process of writing at this moment, is his thoughts on arms control and climate change. In 2016, shortly before the presidential election, I wrote a column for Forbes.com suggesting that George Schultz, if he had the available time, would make a dandy president for these times. He wrote me a very nice note thanking me for that, though I don't know, I'm not sure you agree with the article, but you were kind enough to send me a note. I'm not alone in this sentiment, by the way. Henry Kissinger, writing in his memoirs, wrote, and I quote, if I could choose one American to whom I would entrust the nation's fate, it would be George Schultz. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Secretary of State George Schultz. So here we sit in this beautiful hall. Air conditioning, water, comfortable chairs, just like going to Quantico in 1942 for boot camp, isn't it? Marine Corps boot camp was not like this, <laughs> to put it mildly. But I remember one thing that stuck with me. I remember the day the sergeant handed me my rifle. He said, take good care of this rifle. This is your best friend. And remember one thing. Never point this rifle at anybody unless you're willing to pull the trigger. No empty threats. Boot camp wisdom. You've seen when people violate boot camp wisdom, they lose their ability to have any influence. Nobody pays any attention anymore. <clears throat> I told that story to President Reagan, and we were very careful. And I can remember times in the Situation Room where somebody would say, well, if they do that, that's unacceptable. And he would say, well, what are you going to do if it happens? The answer is nothing. Well, if the answer is nothing, then you accepted it. So it's not unacceptable. Don't say it's unacceptable unless you mean it. You're going to do something. Very important principle. But there's a, another side to it, too. That is, if you're a person who does what you promise to do, then people can trust you and they can deal with you. If you go back on your word, you can't be trusted. So you, you can't be dealt with. So in this sense, I've always felt trust is the coin of the realm in human dealings. And it means that you do what you say you're going to do. And it means you're, you're careful when you commit to do something because you're going to do it. You can't just make empty gestures. So boot camp was not like this, but um, it was a, a very great learning experience for me. About this time last year, I was invited to give a talk at the Marine Corps University, which is in Quantico, and a nice room like this. Here's where the general sit, here's where the colonel sit, and so on. And I came and I said, doesn't look like boot camp to me. But I had a good time there, because so I talked about the interplay of force and strength. It's strength is what you want. Force is a means to an end. So understand this interrelationship. I have sat through a lot of meetings in which you have introduced yourself. What? You have introduced yourself, and you do not say George Schultz, Secretary of State, or Secretary of Treasury, or Secretary of Labor, or OMB Director, University Professor, author of numerous books, advisor to presidents. You introduce yourself with six simple words. George Schultz, United States Marine Corps. 
What is it about being a Marine and serving in the Corps that stays in a man's bloodstream like that for 75 years now? Well, you learn a lot, as I already illustrated in boot camp, but then you learn a lot out in the field in the conflict. For instance, I'm just overseas, having been to boot camp, artillery school overseas, and we have our first action. And particularly in those circumstances, you can be very close to people. You're a team. That's the big thing about the Marines. You're a team. You never leave a guy behind. Team. So I had a sergeant named Patton that I thought the world of. He was a very good guy. And we were having this action. I run over, I looking around for him. I run over, I go, where the hell is Patton? Patton's dead, sir. Standing, I'll always remember that moment. And I say to myself, if I'm ever in a position to advise a president on whether to send people into combat, remember Patton. People lose their lives in war. So you better have a good mission, better be worthwhile, you better equip people to accomplish what they set out to accomplish. And that's the ball game. Mm -hmm. So in preparing for this interview, I read the good book. And if you hadn't read this, perhaps we'll give you a copy as a going away present, it is Learning from Experience, George P. Schultz. This is George Schultz's life and times, but it's not a biography in the pure sense, it's George Schultz offering lessons. What struck me in reading this book, Secretary Schultz, is I've always been a fan of John Wooden. John Wooden, for those who don't know, is a legendary basketball coach at UCLA, famous for two things. Number one, winning on the court. He won 10 basketball championships in the course of 12 years, dominated college basketball. Some of his players think they won the championships. <laughs> <laughs> Who won the Cold War? You or Ronald Reagan? <laughs> <laughs> Team player. But Wooden, Wooden was famous for something called Woodenisms. These were little motivational phrases. Things like, be prepared and be honest. Be quick, but don't hurry. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. As you read Learning from Experience, the book is full of what I call Schultzisms. And I'd like to read a few of these to you, Secretary Schultz, and have you explain what you mean by these. Let's start with this first one, and this comes from your days at Princeton. Everyone learns, including the leader. Well, I had an um, experience at Princeton my senior year. I played football. And I came back to, for the fall practice in the best physical condition I've ever been in my life. And during the cracks, I was really doing great. And I was saying to myself, it's going to be my year. And then I got clipped at his back, blocked across the back of my knees, twisted my left knee, and I was out for the season. So then they asked me to coach the freshman backfield. In those days, the freshman didn't play on the varsity team. There was a freshman team, the varsity team. So it was a pretty talented group of kids. And I was teaching them but it didn't seem to get anywhere. And gradually, it, it dawned on me, it didn't matter what I taught, it mattered what they learned. And if I, so I had said to myself, I've got to create a learning environment where they ask questions and I answer them and all of a sudden they get it and they get onto the Princeton system. And that experience stayed with me. And I always have felt, even if say you're Secretary of State, you're a person, but you've got a team around you. And I always felt if I can create an environment where everybody's learning, I'll create a hot group. I'll have to send people home at night because learning is fun. And learning is the way you get better. And so it was a great experience for me in my teaching career. It's not so much what I teach, it's what the people learn and how to create an environment where people learn. Another saying of yours, seize the moral high ground. And this pertains to your time as labor secretary. Well, <clears throat> for a while I was co-chairman with Clark Kerr of the Armor Automation Fund. Clark was a fantastic guy, he was president of the University of California and a great friend. And what was happening in the meatpacking industry was they had these big old plants in Chicago, Kansas City, Fort Worth, and they would drive the animals to the pl these plants and slaughter them and so on. And somehow it dawned on them, 
we're selling weight. And we're driving the animals all these distances, they're losing weight. So they started to open smaller plants out where the animals were. Uh, seemed like a sensible thing. And closing the old plants. So they closed one in Fort Worth. And this is what our automation committee was supposed to deal with. So we had a little group, union guy, management guy, me, I'm chairman. And we go down to the Fort Worth plant <coughs> And we decided we'd go to the hotel before we went to the plant, get registered, we're going to be there a while. So I introduced myself. The clerk says, oh, we have a very nice suite for you. It's all fixed up. Fine. Management guy registers, same thing. He, he gets a nice room. Union guy comes up. He's a black guy, very talented guy, very good member of our team. And the clerk looks at him and says, I'm sorry, we don't have any room. So he pulls out a slip, confirmation slip, which none of us had, but he'd been there before. And he cuts into the back room, comes out, and he says, we don't have a room. By this time, my blood is boiling. So I said, you do have a room. You gave me a switch to the next room. To put a cotton in a register room. And he did it. And it was the first time any black person was registered in that hotel. But I learned a little from that. I said, you know, if you're on the moral high ground, be clear and sharp and demanding. And sometimes if you catch people a little off guard, they'll do what you want them to do. So I got a lesson out of that. But then there was a further thing that had a big impact on me. <clears throat> the company had decided, as they are getting small plants, to open a little plant in Worthington, Minnesota. And this was a small town. And I went up to the town, and it was a nice plant. There were no black people in the town at all, just white. This was in the mid-1960s when there were race riots all over the country. And suddenly the company closed its plant in Kansas City. And most of the people in the plant were blacks. And they had a lot of seniority. And the sit contract between the union and the company was that if you had enough seniority, you could bump into another plant. So a lot of these people had bumping rights into the new plant. So we started to scratch our heads about this. The governor of Minnesota sent his human rights person down, said, can't you stop this? We're going to have a riot. We, Clark and I talked it over. Look, these people have contractual rights. It's up to us to do everything we can to see that they can exercise those rights. So we started working with the town fathers. And gradually these people said, you know, we're just a little town. Big cities, what do they know? They don't think about people. Everybody in this town knows everybody else. We can get along. Somebody said, well, then we're building a little housing project. They can all live there. Town fathers said, no. We don't want a black guy. We don't want to have them live out among us. Be part of the community. So this was a very healthy thing going on. And then the blacks started sending scouting parties up to find out what it was like. And we'd help them get around and meet people. And all of a sudden, it became clear many of them were tithers in their church. And the church had started to compete for them. I said to Clark, we just turned a corner. Well, then um, things happened. And about 300 moved up to Worthington. And it went off, no problems at all, zero. So a little while later, Clark and I are in New York City, and there was a reporter for the New York Times, very well-known, consequential guy named Dave Braskin. And he had followed the Armour Automation Fund as an innovation in industrial relations practices. So we're having dinner, and he says, what's new? So we told him about this development. And so he didn't ask us. He just quietly got on his little bicycle and went out to Worthington, Minnesota. And all of a sudden, here comes an article in the New York Times, front page, something worked. So it was a very nice article and very well informed. He'd gone out and he'd done his research, so he knew chapter and verse. So then NBC decides to do a documentary. And you know what TV does? They stick a microphone in your face to get you to say something difficult and controversial. So we got calls from all the people and we're thinking, get these people out of here. We don't want publicity. We're getting along fine. 
get him out of here. So we had to call the TV people and said, you're just trying to stir up trouble, get out. And they did. But anyway, it made a big impression because you get people together in a sensible way and they talk to each other and you get somewhere. So later on, I'm more of an answer than you wanted, but anyway, later on, in the next administration, I'm Secretary of Labor, and he decides to end school desegregation in the South in seven southern states. This is 1970. That's about 30, 40 years after the Brown decision. So desegregated schools were unconstitutional, but they were there. And he decided, I don't know why, to desegregate them. He said, it's right morally and right constitutionally. So he understood you have to have somebody to manage this, you can't just do it. So he invited Vice President Agnew, chairman of the committee, and me, the vice chairman, and Agnew would have nothing to do with it. So I become the chairman. Pat Moynihan was working in the White House at the time, so he became a member of a committee, and a wonderful lawyer named Len Garment, the former advance man, Pat Morgan. That was our team. So we talked it over, and I'm remembering my Worthington experience. And I said, we have to have a way of talking to people. So we went to the president and said, Mr. President, we're going to appoint biracial committees in each state. And we don't care anything about the political affiliation of the people we're going to appoint. We just want strong, respected people. That's what we want. So he went along with that. So we got these people identified and appointed. And everybody said Mississippi's the toughest state, so we had them first. They come up to Washington. We had a meeting in the Roosevelt Room. I knew enough from my labor relations experience that you gotta let people up, blow off steam for a little bit, so they did. And the black people were all saying this is a good idea, and the whites were saying it's a lousy idea. So I let them carry on for about half an hour. And then I stopped and I said, I brought in the Attorney General. I said, Mr. Attorney General, what are you gonna do when the school's open? Said, I'm gonna enforce the law. Thank you very much, leave. <laughs> so then I could say, well, it's been an interesting discussion this morning, but it's irrelevant. It's gonna happen, whether you think it's a good idea or not. So then the only question is, what's gonna happen? These are your communities, these are your children. So you have a stake. And I've always found, if you get people talking about principles and they have different principles, you don't get anywhere. If you get them to talk about problems, then there's kind of an instinct to solve problems. So that's the atmosphere that we created. So they started really to talk about problems that would come up and how to handle them. And <clears throat> then I took them over to the State Department diplomatic reception rooms where there is the desk that Thomas Jefferson built himself and used to write the Declaration of Independence. The quill is still there. And he writes, all men are created equal. So I showed him that desk. Then we were having lunch and I was sitting with the two people that I had identified as people who would be the co-chairman. And they're, it's going well, so I get up and leave. And there's a lawyer from the Justice Department there who gets at me, what are you leaving for? Just about to get there. I said, you don't get it. If I'm there and they come to an agreement, it's my agreement. If I'm not there and they are just them, it's their agreement. And the whole name of the game in these things is to make it their agreement, something they decide they want to do, then they own it. So I taught them a little lesson. Anyway, we go back to the White House and they're getting into a pretty good stride. And we go across the hall to the Oval Office sort of on a queue with the president. And he says, here we are in the Oval Office. Think of the decisions that have been made here that affected the security and welfare of our country. Well, I've made my decision on this issue, but that's not enough in a country like ours. You have to make your decisions. It's gotta be in the states and the communities and the human beings. You've gotta make their decisions if this is gonna work. And so we had a discussion around, and it was very inspiring. Then we, so then they go back, and we went through the various things. The last state was Louisiana. 
It's about a month before the school openings. So Pat Moynihan and I had thought, you know, let's do this in the South. Be a sort of symbolism there. And we can do our Louisiana group, and in the afternoon after we're through with that, we'll get the co-chairman from each of the states there, and we'll have a general discussion in the South, and that'll be a signal at the start of the school year. So we have a meeting in the Oval House. I make my pitch, and Agnew says, Mr. President, don't go. There you will be in a room, half the people will be black, half the people will be white. There's going to be blood running through the streets of the South. If you go, the blood will be on your hands. Don't go. He looks at me. I'm a non-politician in the crowd. I said, well, Mr. President, whatever happens, it's on your watch. But you've seen these people come up here. They're good people. You've been inspiring. They haven't been idle. They've been working. And we've been working with them. So I think this is our chance to have this go well. And this move in the South will be a good part of it. So he decides to go. So Pat and I go in the night before to work in the morning. And we're working, it's going along, but not quite as well as usual. And I'm be dawning on me. It's one thing to have people come to the White House. It's another thing to meet in a hotel room in their hometown. It's not the same. But anyway, by the time that all of a sudden the president arrives, and I have to go out and say to him, Mr. President, they're not in quite, they're not in quite the shape they are usually in. When you see them in the Oval Office, you've got to put this over yourself. So he did a good job and got the thing over. And we have our general meeting. It was like a revival meeting. People were saying, thought of this problem, thought of that problem. What are you going to do? They're back and forth all the time. It was terrific. It was inspiring. And um, then we're riding back on Air Force One, and the president comes back. We're sitting around talking. And the only guy with any Southern credentials in our group was a man named Bryce Harlow, a very wise counselor. And the president says, so Bryce, how do you think it's going to go? And Bryce says, Mr. President, I think it's going to go pretty well in the South. Problem is going to be when it comes north, where all the lawyers have been coming from preaching to the South. That's where the problem's going to be. And he says, why is that, Bryce? He says, well, become the South. We know each other. They're in our homes. They take care of our children. If they get sick, we take care of them. If we get sick, they take care of us. We have human relationships. In the North, they talk a good game, but they don't have human relationships. Well, as it turned out, the schools opened and there was no violence, much to everybody's surprise. But a lot of it was because we had worked at it person to person and try to identify problems and figure out how to get them resolved and create an atmosphere of uh, partnership. So that's a long way around your question. But anyway, one of the most interesting things I did in my public service was that experience. <laughs>